Hi, I'm Dr. Kathan Badani from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. I'm happy to be here uh, to provide this video. So I was asked to talk about my technique for robotic partial nephrectomy. So I thought what might be very interesting uh, for the audience is to show a fairly complex partial but how we apply our standardized principles to it. So whether it's an easy partial nephrectomy based on tumor size and location or whether it's a very challenging partial nephrectomy, we still utilize the same standardized approach that gets us to the end, end point. So with that, let's go to the case. So I was asked to show a transperitoneal approach, multi-port uh, partial nephrectomy. This is in a recurrent renal mass on the right side. And again, I'm gonna show how we implement our standardized procedures. So 71 year old female had a history of a partial nephrectomy on the right side in 2016. Um, a little bit on the large side, BMI of 30. And here you can see the, the completely endophytic lesion, recurrent tumor on the same side uh, highlighted here. So, although very reasonable um, indication for partial nephrectomy, it isn't a patient that's had prior surgery on this kidney. Uh, and so I think it'll be interesting and educational uh, video. Here's a coronal view, just showing you the, the vasculature and the tumor itself. So we'll go to the video and you know I have a very standardized instrumentation and orchestration so I use the um, force bipolar in my left hand monopolar scissors in my right hand and then I'm going to use the tip up grasper in my fourth arm that's on the top of the screen because this is a redo operation you can see that you have to spend a little bit of time releasing adhesions since this was a right-sided tumor uh, you're seeing the liver adhesed uh, to the kidney here. And if you take your time, you can always release the, li release the liver uh, off the retroperitoneal surface. My guess is, and this operation was done uh, in another country, so I don't have access to the details of the first operation, but my guess is that this was an anterior tumor given the density, and you'll see of the adhesions um, as we get closer to the kidney. But carefully releasing these adhesions is an important part of redo surgery. And it's also an important part of any partial nephrectomy you're going to do on the right side. Many times it's hard to predict the adhesions that come from, say, a cholecystectomy or any other surgery that may have happened, um, even hepatitis. So here we see a nice release of space between the kidney and the liver. I use a... Um, locking retractor on the right side when I want to reflect the, uh, the liver. I don't always put a liver retractor port in. And so typically what I'll do is I'll look and see how much of the liver is covering the kidney. And if I do need to retract the liver, I put a five millimeter sub xiphoid port uh, to do a, a locking grasping static liver retraction. So here now we're seeing where the kidney and the liver um, have adhesed to each other. So I've worked all the way around the worst area, behind it and in front of it and underneath it. Uh, but now we've got some adhesions between liver and kidney, and so we have to carefully work our way through this. So first, that looked like liver to me, but what we're seeing is renal cortex on the edge of liver. And I'll tell you that by and large, if you do enough robotic kidney surgery, um, Cutting into the liver or resecting part of the liver with the tumor becomes a more comfortable thing to do. I mean, you can even reconstruct the liver capsule using the sliding cliprinorphy we use for partial nephrectomies, and I've done that on, on the liver. And so liver work, you know, these, these techniques we use on the kidney work very well on the liver. Obviously, ideally, we don't want to hurt the liver at all, but you see the direct adhesion and fusion of the liver capsule to the kidney capsule. And so what I've done here is I've gone into the capsule, the kidney a bit. You can see it decapsulized on the top there, but not where the tumor is anyways. And remember the tumor is fully endophytic, so it's not going to be sticking out. But I need access to the hilum. I need to be able to clamp this kidney given the endophytic nature of the tumor. 
So we really do have to reflect the kidney off the liver here. And what I want to show you at the end is after we've done all this work, and as bad as this uh, adhesion was, the liver looks pretty good in the end, the kidney looks pretty good in the end, and we're able to accomplish our goal. And so if you just take your time and you go through this, and the other thing I want to point out is what my assistant is doing. My assistant is using the suction to hold the liver up so that I can push on the kidney like this and I have traction and counter traction. And the, uh, the, suction, the suction instrument actually is a very good liver retractor because it doesn't poke into the surface of the, of the liver and you have control over how much you have to push. So I really do, even if I'm using a liver retractor, I actually use the suction to do the active retracting while we're doing this part and then put in the, the locking liver retractor if I want to do that. So this is a little bit of the last of the adhesions and now we're completely free. Although we've scuffed up the liver a little bit and the kidney a little bit, we've completely mobilized it and we're good to go. And so typically what I do here on the diaphragm is I release the liver a little bit so I have somewhere solid to grab um, with the locking retractor. And that's my very last step. So now we're coming in with the liver retractor through the sub xiphoid port and we're able to carefully, safely, and very effectively uh, reflect the liver. And you see a little bit of adhesion left here. We'll cut the little, the little bit at the end and then we can move on with the actual kidney part of this operation. The other thing is this little pocket here between the gerotas and the liver is always nice to create so you have something strong to grab onto with the locking re retractor. Anyways, this part is done. It takes a little extra time in these adherent cases. So now we're going to go to the next step, which is reflection of colon and reflection of duodenum, identification of retroperitoneal structures. What I will typically do is grasp the fat and incise a solid centimeter or two centimeters far from the colon uh, and then and then reflect it in that line and you see my left hand pulling down as I'm dissecting and that creates the space and I'm as you can see very far away actually from the bowel line and that's okay you can reflect this as far down as you want to and you risk no thermal injury to the bowel and so I stay a centimeter away make my line and again, you're going to identify that yellow fat of the retroperitoneum versus the yellow fat of the peritoneum. And you see a very clear difference in the color of that fat. So now we have gonadal vein, ureter was just seen, and on the right side you'll see the anterior surface of the vena cava. And what I'll do is I'll incise the retroperitoneum about half a centimeter lateral to the gonadal vein. And I almost always will preserve the gonadal vein because you don't need to sacrifice it in most cases. <clears throat> and you follow the gonadal vein up to the renal vein, as you see here. The, uh, the duodenum is already cocorized, probably from the prior surgery, so I didn't have to really release it. But typically you do have to release the duodenum off the anterior surface of the vena cava. And now the hilar dissection. So you see the two renal veins, this tip-up retractor is very nice for hyalur dissection. That upward grab lets you operate with both hands, and you don't have to use your hand for retraction. You have two hands to actually dissect with. And I think one of the things that um, a lot of pure laparoscopic surgeons have appreciated about robotics is that in laparoscopic surgery, you're always using one hand to retract and dissecting with the other, whereas with the robot, you have both hands to dissect with. And that's something you have to just consciously do. But once you do it, you'll always use a fourth arm to do this step because it's so nice to have two hands to do, uh, to do dissection. So you see the, the artery and the vein being dissected. And again, in a partial nephrectomy, you don't necessarily have to dissect out the vein. You can, for sure. And on the right side, because it's a short renal vein and because it's close to the vena cava, 
and because it's a endophytic tumor, you may see significant back bleeding. And so clamping the vein is a very reasonable thing to do, but definitely it's an option. But it's very important to take your time and skeletonize the renal artery. You want the bulldogs to sit on there correctly. You want them to cause the appropriate occlusion they need to do. And if you don't really spend some time and skeletonize the renal artery, I think the quality of the ischemia is not gonna be as good. And so here I have both sides of the artery. There's the far side, here's the close side. And I just got a little bit of stuff, I'm just gonna clean it off so that when I do put these uh, bulldog clamps in, um, so you see a little bit of stuff on the left, a little bit of stuff on the right, and done. And so when I do put the bulldog clamps in, I know they're gonna effectively occlude this artery. These are lymphatic branches, but many times they're, va they're vascular actually and not lymphatic, so I do, I do take my time. I like a clean field, and you can see you can do this even in a redo setting. You see scarring around the renal artery a little bit more than you usually would see, but that's because it's been dissected before. Next step is exposure of the renal mass. So here, it's a fully endophytic tumor, so we may not see it from the outside, but we know generally where it's going to be. And it is my practice and belief that you need to widely expose the capsular surface of the kidney. One of the things that really makes a partial nephrectomy difficult is if you don't have wide exposure of the kidney when you're doing the renorphy, you may have to end up dissecting more fat to get your space, to get your angles. And really, you don't want to do that during clamp time. Um, and so take your time and really expose the kidney, especially in these endophytic tumors, because you don't want to be managing the kidney and the fat around the kidney. So here we've got the lower pole, the whole lateral surface of the kidney exposed. There's a little bit that isn't done anteriorly. So I'm just going to take the extra time and do it because you can see the bulge of the tumor on top. But I just want to have that excellent wide exposure on the surface of this kidney. So I'm going all the way down and you see it doesn't add much time. And even if it's adherent fat, or what we call toxic fat. Um, it may add a little bit of time to do the extra dissection, but again, it's well worth it because if you need to have more exposure and you have adherent fat, that's even more difficult when you have, you know, halfway through an excision, on clamp time, etc. To be honest with you, the amount of time it takes to do a little bit of a wider exposure of the kidney isn't that much time. So the value is far higher than the time <laughs> allotted for this. <clears throat> okay, so now we have the entire lower pole posteriorly, anteriorly exposed. So now we're gonna do something extremely important and that is of course intraoperative ultrasound. Intraoperative ultrasound is one of the most important things you do doing partial nephrectomy. And it's really the only time you really learn how to get good at this. So you really have to take your time and mark out where this tumor is. On an endophytic tumor, you have to make sure that you're marking out at the correct angles. If you mark it out because you see it on the ultrasound, but you're not at the, at the point closest to the surface, you can completely miss these endophytic tumors. I have seen that happen. And so you find the spot closest to the surface and you work away from there to make your circular mark for the endophytic tumor. So although we cut the amount of time ultrasounding short in the video, I really do spend a reasonable amount of time on intraoperative ultrasound, especially in these complicated um, situations. So here, <clears throat> I'm just dissecting to find the smaller branch of this renal artery. And as you know, as you see here, because it's an endophytic tumor and because it does go lat, uh, posteriorly, uh, I would just wanna have full ischemic control of this kidney. And so, yes, all of this prior surgical scarring around the hilum is not pleasant. But as you work your way through this, and you see the force bipolar, the monopolar scissors, it's a bit of a tedious thing to do, but it's well worth taking the time to dissect these out. So now we've got um, this lower pole branch, lower pole vein, and the renal artery, all dissected out. <clears throat> you 
You see the bulldog clamps at the bottom of the screen pre-placed. Uh, and so I'll place them now. Again, at this point, you can make sure everything's set at your table side assistant for clamp time. That could be your sutures. That could be um, the bag for bagging the specimen, the bulldogs. You know, we do run a quick check before we clamp. And both renal arteries clamped and we can go to the excision. So I'm going to trust my ultrasound view of this, right? And so I made my mark and I'm gonna trust it. And as I cut, one of the most important things you can do is A, see it. You wanna see and visualize what's happening here. And the way I do that is I use my fourth arm to stabilize the kidney underneath the tumor, not holding the tumor, holding the normal part of the kidney. And then the suction keeps the field extremely dry to see it. <clears throat> now, here's a little exposure, right? This is a little tumor thrombus we're seeing, but you can course correct. You can come around it and excise it widely, and that's the beauty of the magnification of robotics. But look at the plane. There is a pseudo capsule that forms with the renal parenchyma at the base of this tumor. And you wanna find that and continue to follow it. And you do that with not just sharply cutting, but a sweeping motion. A sweeping motion that actually dissects out this plane. And you see there's a rim of normal parenchyma on the majority of this tumor. <clears throat> Top looks good. There's that bottom part, but it's been widely excised. It's kind of a, you know, lobular tumor. <clears throat> and then the renorphy. The only instrument change that happens in this operation for me is that right hand becomes a needle driver. The scissor becomes a needle driver. It is single-handedly the only instrument change on the Da Vinci system that I do. And so I've minimized the need for all of the issues that come up with instrument changes, the port falling out, the instrument being expired, um, losing pneumoperitoneum, et cetera. Um, and my assistant can just focus on their one instrument port and their one instrument and not have to keep worrying about changing instruments. So I have brought this down to a four instrument operation and um, it could be a three instrument operation if you want to um, uh, not change, you know, not change the fourth arm and use that as a scissor or, or vice versa. But it's a, four, it's a four instrument operation with one instrument change for the partial nephrectomy. So the inner layer is a 3.0 VLOC suture or any barb suture actually. Um, and one of the things to, to pay attention to here is just covering the surface of the defect. So that's collecting system. And so as you're cutting out the tumor, you have to, in your mind, remember where you may have cut into collecting system because sometimes you don't see it as well when you're doing the renorphy, especially if there's some venous back bleeding like you see here. It's not a lot, but it's a little bit. And so usually we mark it out. My assistant will know and I'll say, oh, lower pole, right side, upper pole, left side. And so when we go back, we can pay special attention to making sure we're over sewing it. I don't individually over sew branched arteries. I don't individually over sew collecting system. I run my stitch from the top of the defect to the bottom, making sure that I specifically incorporate those things into my uh, running suture. So here, I'm doing that, right? I close that collecting system. Here's another collecting system entry. And so as I'm running this from the upper right to the lower left, I want to make sure I'm specifically closing that with my running sutures. And depending on the size of the defect, and because this is a very endophytic tumor, you're going to have a wider defect. It may take two or three um, lines of suture to completely cover the surface area of the kidney, but it's okay. Uh, and then I'm going to show you early unclamping and why that's valuable. And so ultimately the ischemia time, even in very big defects, is usually very reasonable. <clears throat> I mean, in general, our clamp time um, is the 95th percentile range is anywhere from six minutes to 12. Yeah, there are some cases where the ischemia time will approach 18, 19 minutes, but uh, by and large, the 95th percentile of these cases, you know, irrespective of tumor complexity, is in that small range. And that's because of the standardization in early in clamping. So we did the inner layer. I'm going to unclamp and we'll look for any arterial bleeders uh, once we've unclamped.
Okay, and <clears throat> because there's no real bleeding going on, I'm gonna remove all the bulldog, so I don't have to worry about that. Give the kidney time to reperfuse. And then usually after a minute or so, you see, you'll see you um, see the, the reperfusion of it. But no real significant arterial bleeding. The little venous bleeding you see from the cortex is acceptable. And then I'll do my second layer. This is a zero vicro suture. You can see it's tagged on the end like the other ones are with a clip. And I typically try to go full thickness, if I can, from one side to the other. One of the things about partial nephrectomy that has changed is we don't need to close the defect, right? That's not a goal anymore. Now the goal is to actually just compress it. And so what I'm doing here is since I can't reach all the way to the other side, I'm going almost all the way to the other side and then, and then taking the next bite. My goal is not to close this defect. So as the whole length of the tumor base is covered, then I can clip the other side. And basically what I'm doing is I'm not closing it like this, I'm just compressing it at the bottom, which is where the bleeders would be and the pseudoaneurysms form and the missed art arteries are uh, become an issue later. <clears throat> and so when we do it this way, we've really minimized the risk of that. And again, however many stitches you think you need to create some nice compression at the base is what you use. In this case, I used three interrupted and I always do it interrupted. And then I, I tend to lock them in. These are lapratize, but you can use another hemolock clip. Um, you can tie it or you can just leave it. Many people don't put a second clip on. Um, I, like to, I like to secure it, um, and so I, I do use a lapratize. But the other thing you can do is take the second hemolock clip and clip it in. This is endocyanine green. This is the Firefly view. And I want to see if the rest of the kidney is perfused appropriately. And I think this is a wonderful use of Firefly because especially in these deeper tumors, sometimes you do knock off branch renal arteries and an entire portion of the kidney can be ischemic. And although we don't necessarily act on that, um, it's good to know that ahead of time. But here you see good perfusion of the remaining cortex and the remaining part of the kidney. <clears throat> so I'll finish my um, Lapratai clips here and Renorphy is finished. And if I, if I remember correctly, I think the warm ischemia time on this was very reasonable in the low teens. Watch it for a few minutes, make sure nothing is bleeding, and then we can start cutting the needles out uh, and removing the needles. And so we'll do that. <clears throat> One of the other things to keep in mind if you're using this type of technique is um, you have to keep track of how many needles you use. One of the things I do with my assistant and my tech is that I will say how many VLOCs are in and how many zeros are in and say three VLOCs, three zeros. So then we separate them so there's no confusion about, uh, about the stitches. So all three of us know, me, surgical tech, and the primary assistant, how many stitches are in there and how many needles need to be removed. And then uh, many times you can bag the tumor before you do all the rest, but the bag gets in the way and because we only have one assistant port I use, um, sometimes I'll bag it at the end. And then this is a Surgicel powder, it's a hemostatic agent. Again, optional, a lot of controversy as to whether you need this stuff or not. Um, so here I'm showing its utilization, but definitely the field is dry, you don't need to use it. But if you choose to use a hemostatic agent, I do like the powder very much because it covers the surface area, the raw surface area, very nicely. So again, you know, in this case, recurrent tumor, clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and, you know, had a good outcome. So I think my ending point here is that if you standardize your approach to robotic partial nephrectomy, then you'll be able to tackle low complexity, intermediate complexity, high complexity tumors because you're using the same approach. And of course that's going to increase your experience and you're going to do more challenging partials and you're going to do more challenging cases and more patients will benefit from partial nephrectomy over radical nephrectomy as your experience in standardization improves. So keep doing it, keep taking good care of your patients and standardize your robotic partial nephrectomy approach. I want to again thanks for inviting me uh, to showcase our technique. And if you want to reach me, this is my contact information. 
feel free to send me any messages. Take care. Have a great day.